Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> In the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We don't want to shortchange our speaker this morning. My name is Brian King. I have the pleasure of being able to welcome you all to another season of our uh, Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Although it feels like endless summer out there, this is the official uh, um, note in the schedule that suggests that uh, another year has started, another academic calendar has started, and we are delighted with the Grand Round schedule that, uh, that we have this year. Uh, Carol Rockhill and Ann Vanderstoop have once again done a spectacular job of lining up uh, world-class speakers, uh, both from our own uh, location regionally here and also uh, nationally. And as evidence of that, our first speaker is, uh, is an absolute rock star in the field of ADHD. Uh, Dr. Joel Nigg um, got his uh, undergraduate degree from a school called Harvard University, where he was magna cum laude. Uh, then went on to get a degree in social work in Michigan and worked there for a number of years before coming out west and getting a PhD at Berkeley in clinical psychology. He then uh, came up here to Seattle Children's and the University of Washington and did an internship which was clearly the capstone in his distinguished education. And actually as you look at his CV that was really the inflection point because after that he published 120 papers. Um, and uh, had a distinguished, has had a distinguished career uh, as an academician, moving up the ranks to, uh, to professor at Michigan State University and then coming out to Oregon Health Sciences University where he currently is director um, of the Division of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry. He holds appointments in several other departments uh, at the OHSU including pediatrics and even molecular genetics. Um, and uh, has long uh, been recognized as an international expert in the area of ADHD. He is one of the uh, people who has been uh, very involved in the DSM-5 process uh, on the Disruptive Behavior Disorders Committee and other committees as part of the DSM as well. His work has been funded to the tune of millions of dollars by NIH as he helps us understand the pathophysiology uh, and causes of ADHD. And so it is uh, with uh, tremendous pleasure that I have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to welcome Dr. Nig uh, to kick off this new year of our Grand Rounds presentations. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be back here and I'm looking forward to seeing the hospital today and all the changes that have happened since I was here last in the last century. So it's, uh, it's great to be here and always a pleasure. Uh, I love Seattle and uh, really, really have great memories of Seattle Children's. I'm going to talk a little bit today about our um, ADHD program uh, at OHSU. And uh, there's a couple of elements I just want to flag for you overall. The, the theme of our work over the years has really been pretty consistent on the idea that ADHD is not just one thing, but it's a constellation of traits and possibly of types that are not well described by the current nomenclature and how can we improve upon that has been one of the fundamental questions. And of course we want to ask that question because if we can better characterize the components of this syndrome, we probably will get more leverage on what causes it, how to treat it, how to prevent it. And so I'm going to focus primarily today on the question of heterogeneity of ADHD and how we might resolve that in new ways. I will try to spend a little time at the end addressing the question of causes of ADHD and where that might go. The primary focus of the work at Oregon is on a cohort of families, about 420 families that we're following over time, some of them with children with ADHD at time one and some without ADHD at time one, and then we, we are starting to follow them. And we really focus on three levels. One, we have a very detailed phenotypic characterization. We also do uh, the primary model is a temperament model that looks at physiological and behavioral analyses of temperament components. And then we also are doing, we have a neuroimaging uh, component to this cohort. And then we, although we're not funded at a big scale yet, we are doing genetics and family dynamics and nutrition and other areas tacking on, kind of, um, uh, no one's accused us of not being ambitious enough, I guess. And then I also uh, 
we're also starting to develop a, a cohort of pregnant women who have ADHD in themselves or their partner and looking at prenatal risk factors and then early brain development in the MRI with the idea that we can try to predict ADHD from before birth. That's kind of the long-term goal and that would enable uh, eventual prevention of the, uh, of, the, of the disorder in those that are injured. So uh, let me talk about neuropsychology of ADHD. One of the uh, issues in the literature, there's two issues in the literature that are fundamental. One of them is that there's a lot of different ideas of what's wrong neuropsychologically. And all of these different mechanisms are proposed as so-called endophenotypes, meaning they're markers of liability for the disorder that would help us detect genes or other causes. And one of the problems has been that each study that's published, and there's been hundreds if not thousands of studies like this, will pick their favorite mechanism. I like working memory. Well, I like arousal. Well, I like response inhibition. And then they, they test kids with ADHD and without ADHD, and lo and behold, the ADHD kids do worse, and we've got our answer. And the problem is that these don't all work equally well. They all work, but not equally well. In, in this, just in this example here, this is from a large sample of children with ADHD and sibs of, who do not have ADHD from uh, of full siblings. You can see the yellow bars, the control group is at zero. We scale everything to zero in all the graphs I'll show you today. I always scale the control group mean to zero. So everything you see is a worsening from normal. But you can see that the ADHD kids all have, they do badly in all these measures. Any one of these you could say, yeah, they, the real problem is cognitive control. The real problem is response variability. The real problem is temporal processing. They do badly in all of them. And we've, we're doing some work putting them all at the same time as predictors. And you can see that some of them are better predictors than others when they are pitted head to head against each other. But one of the, one of the fundamental uh, characteristics of a good endophenotype is it should show up in unaffected relatives. And what we've done here is looked at siblings. Not only do the siblings not have ADHD, but we've co-varied statistically whatever symptoms they do have. So this is completely independent of the sim siblings' ADHD symptomatology and disorder. And you can see that the siblings still have a mild weakness on several of these functions, suggesting they are promising as endophenotypes, but not on all of them. So you can really see significant differences here and uh, that some of these work better than others. So one of the first issues is there are components, but not all the components are e equally good once you start looking at how they function and how they perform. The second issue is that ADHD has to be tried to be subtyped. They aren't all the same. Uh, one of the questions on the previous slide is whether all the kids are showing the same profile, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes on those different measures. But the other is how can we subtype the kids? In DSM-4 and in DSM-5 with a, a significant softening of that, we will, we've had subtypes of combined and inattentive and hyperactive. And I'm going to just focus on the combined and inattentive here because the hyperactive type has got a, a number of problems with it. I'm going to, so I'm going to bypass those and ignore that group today. Uh, but <coughs> what you can see here is that on every single measure, it's the same pattern. The combined type kids do the worst, and the inattentive type kids do the middle, and the control group is the best. And the, often the inattentive kids are significantly different than the combined kids. That could support a concept of, ah, these are different subtypes. They have significantly different results on this neuropsych measure. But the pattern is always the same, which is that the combined type kids are worse than the inattentive kids. Why is that really unexciting? because these kids have more symptoms than these kids. They're more severe symptomatically. We already know they're worse without doing neuropsych measures. Now we do neuropsych measures, and yeah, we find the same thing. The, with more symptoms means worse performance. That's not a breakthrough. That's just a further description of the syndrome. And so what we need for subtyping is we need to show that there's a configural difference, that you have fewer symptoms but worse performance on something. That's a promising subtype, but just to show severity. And this has been a big problem in our field is whenever we subtype ADHD, it's actually not just true in ADHD, it's true in depression, other to some extent too, but we've had many um, latent class analyses and other interesting analyses to try to get subtypes, but when you really get at them with mixture models and so on, it's really just a, a severity dimension. And so one of our big questions is can we find subtypes that are not just severity and what would that look like? So that's a key uh, focus for my talk today. So I want to go through three strategies for trying to figure out subtypes using these types of neuropsychological and other temperament and physiological measures that might help us see if we can get subtypes that are maybe something beyond just severity. So the first strategy here 
is to refine the clinical description that we already have with ADHD symptoms. And there's one refinement that's been often discussed in the literature and was discussed at great length in the DSM-5 work group, and that is the question of, of ADD, or ADHD without hyperactivity. We've got a subtype of inattentive ADHD, but that subtype of, of inattention in DSM is you can have five symptoms of hyperactivity and be inattentive type. Five symptoms of hyperactivity is a lot more than normal. You can have zero symptoms of hyperactivity and be inattentive. That's a lot less than normal. So you can be way worse than normal or way better than normal on hyperactivity and still be the inattentive type. This concept here is to try to say they really don't have hyperactivity. They really have no evidence of hyperactivity. So what we've done here is, based on a number of, of prior studies and work, we put a cutoff at two or fewer symptoms of hyperactivity. These children still meet criteria for DSM-4 ADHD in every other way. They have six or more symptoms of inattention. They've been through a kitty SADS and a parent and teacher rating scale and a consensus clinical conference to make sure that they really have ADHD. But they clearly have two or fewer symptoms of, of inattention. And they have a T-score less than 50 on standardized ratings of activity. So they are lower than average on activity, but severe on inattention. And they're impaired the whole nine yards. So this is our low attention group uh, that we're going to look at as distinct from the DSM-4 definition of inattentive type. The second piece of this strategy is we don't want to look at the standard measures that I just showed you, all the measures that, that show severity effects. Here we're going to use a new task that is designed to isolate attentional selection that is not reliant on cognitive control, cognitive control being the core problem in many, from many points of view on the standard ADHD. So here we're taking advantage of, a, of a, what's something that's known in the cognitive literature called the attentional blink. And the strategy here is very simple. We, we show you on the computer a series of letters. They run by very fast, about uh, 9 per second or 10 per second. So after a little bit, you know, 20 of these go by very quickly. And then you're simply asked in the first baseline task here, was there a Z? A bunch of letters go by really fast. OK, was there a Z, yes or no? It's actually pretty easy. Most people can say oh, yeah, accurately whether or not there was a Z. That part's not hard. Then it gets hard. Then we say, OK, now you have two things you have to do. Uh, at the end, I want you to tell me what the blue letter was, and also was there a Z? And then our manipulation is we vary the, the Z. Sometimes it's right after the blue letter, 100 milliseconds later. Sometimes it's half a second later. And what happens with normal adults is the blue letter comes along, and you, you process that for a split second. And during that split second, you miss the Z. You don't see the Z. That's the attentional blink. Then as you come out here further out, five or six positions, you start to pick up the Z again uh, as you consolidate that information. So this is the dual task. And that's a fairly involuntary response. If you're really doing the task, I mean, of course, you can ignore one of them and not really follow the instructions. But if you try to do the task, it's, it's involuntary to have that blink. You can't really decide whether or not you're going to blink. This is a, f a, a form of automatic filtering that would be consistent with theories of a kind of parietal dysfunction in inattention. So here's the single task results. And we have three groups here. We've got a group of ADHD combined type kids, a group of ADHD inattentive kids who meet our stringent criteria for pure inattention, or ADD for the, for the, to butcher the history of this term and just use that for simplicity. And then uh, typically developing controls who do not have ADHD and never did. I should also mention that th in the ADD group, they had to never have met criteria for a combined type ever in their life. So that was another uh, restriction on that group. So here, they're all 90% accurate or above. The groups are all the same. Uh, that's all as it should be on the simple task of was there a Z. Now we get to the interesting part, which is the dual task. And I want to bring your attention first to the control group here, the blue group. And you see the attention of blink here works perfectly. They start out at almost 70% accurate at lag one. Then by leg two, here's the blink. They missed the Z. They're at chance. Was there a Z? They're essentially 50% accurate. That's random chance. They can't see the Z. Then at four and five positions out, they come back and they detect it again pretty normally. So they get a beautiful attentional blink uh, on the children who are typically developing. Then in the ADHD kids with combined type, we see a blink also. It's a little shallower. They don't recover. And I'm really mad at myself for not having gone out six and seven positions. The, our hypothesis is they would probably recover out here, a little slower recovery. But it's still pretty normal response. At least there's some kind of a blink. What's striking is that the ADD kids have a completely different pattern of responses. They're not blinking. 
uh, they're staying accurate. In some way, they're performing better. Um, it's not explained by cost up here. It's as if their filter isn't working. Um, interpreting this could get us into some real, real nuances about how attention works, but the bottom line is you cannot explain this as severity. All right, this is a less severe group. They're more severe than the blue group, less severe than the green group, performing totally different than both groups. So it's a possible subtype marker that isn't explainable by severity. That's what we're after, is that kind of, of uh, configural difference, whatever it may mean. All right, let's a second strategy. A second strategy is to broaden our target beyond attention. So here I went beyond cognitive control, but I stayed on attention. Now I'm going to go outside of attention entirely and move into the areas of arousal and emotion regulation. These are two other domains where there's lots of discussion about ADHD uh, being involved in these areas, but these are not core symptoms in the DSM symptom list. So we're kind of broadening our understanding uh, using conceptual basis. And we have a theory paper a few years ago, BJ Casey and I kind of outlining the rationale for why this would make sense. How are we going to subtype? Well, we, we decided that we were very interested in this idea of um, emotional under arousal or non-responsiveness. And there's been a lot of literature now on this concept of callous emotional traits in children with conduct disorder. And uh, this group is fairly well characterized physiologically in the adult literature as having low sympathetic arousal and being unresponsive in terms of emotional stimuli in the same way that normal adults are. So there, and there's a little literature now in children suggesting a similar pattern. It's a tricky literature because in conduct disorder, uh, we've had a lot of discussion in DSM about having a subtype or a specifier for conduct disorder with callous and emotional traits. And this has been heavily debated because of concern that it would increase stigma in these children. Someone who used to have unsocialized conduct disorder, that was gotten rid of in DSM-4 because of all the stigma that was attached to it. Judges and prosecutors and so on in the criminal justice system would kind of, were seen as, as giving up on these unsocialized conduct disorder kids. And so that was eliminated. But now uh, new literature suggesting, A, that the Kelson emotional specifier does not increase stigma over and above conduct disorder among judges and, and other, uh, although there's dispute about this literature. But secondly, more importantly, that the kids who have conduct disorder with Kelson emotional respond to different treatments. They can be improved upon both different treatments than other conduct disorder kids. And they aren't necessarily going to go on to be psychopathic adults. So not the same people. They will go on to worse antisocial outcomes, but not necessarily psychopathy. So it's not necessarily a, a, a fatalistic sentence. However, coming back to ADHD, there's no such specifier in ADHD. There's been very little research on whether the Kelson emotional specifier would also give us a meaningful subdivision in kids who do not have conduct disorder but have ADHD. Our thinking was it should because this is a definition of emotion, differences in emotional processing. So what we did here is we um, used the pro-social ratings by parents and teachers on this strength and difficulties questionnaire. This is uh, highly correlated with Kelson emotional. In fact, I think Kelson emotional might get called lack of pro-social affect or something like that. Uh, there's still this final last minute discussion about the terminology. Again, we were fairly stringent. Parents and teachers had to agree that this child was in the 90th percentile of being calcium emotional or below the 10th percentile in terms of any evidence of, of pro-social uh, instincts in, uh, na compared to national standards or national norms. They all met criteria for ADHD by our extensive evaluation with structured interview, parent-teacher ratings, clinical consensus conference impairment, rule outs, none of them had conduct disorder. So we're not using the conduct disorder group here. So the results are, and we covaried conduct symptoms, so the results you're going to see here are not going to be explainable by conduct disorder. Now our task was to get emotion processing as our measure, and we did this in the following way. We showed the kids um, uh, uh, some, some videos here. We took our baseline scores, and then they watched a video here of these three animals, acute dog, another cute dog, and a cute cat. One dog's kind of cuter than the other one, but they're both pretty cute. And <laughs> this video, the, the, the animals are lost. It's, it's called Homeward Bound. And the first few times you watch it, you know, by about the 50th or 60th time, it's not as gripping. But the first few times you watch it, it's, it's pretty good. And so we showed the kids a clip. And the first clip was negative here. The animals are lost. They're falling down mine shafts. They're getting discouraged. They're going to give up. They're not going to make it. And all the kids agreed when we rated, had them rate this that this was worrisome and negative, and this part was, was a more negative emotion. All the kids in all the groups agreed with this equally strongly. In the positive part, everything is getting better. The animals come home. Everybody's happy. And although it's a little bit of a high energy um, 
somewhat positive stress, nonetheless, there is ultimately a happy ending. And this, all the children agreed very strongly and equally strongly in all the groups that this was positive emotion. So we had a negative and positive emotion. And then we also had a manipulation where they had to regulate their emotion in a way that's been pretty standard in the adult emotional literature, which is just deliberately don't show your feelings, don't show your emotions. This is deliberate control of your emotions. And so the first time you match the emotion, then you hide it. And all the, ki all the children um, agreed they were trying to do this, and I'll come back in a minute to the validity of that uh, effort. Now here's the results. Our, our index here is physiological measures of um, emotion regulation here. We used heart rate measures, and our first measure is rep respiratory sinus arrhythmia. We measure respiration, we measure heart rate, and then we look at response across these conditions. There's been decades of discussion about what RSA means, but one of the interpretations, it's an index of vagal tone, it's an index of engagement of regulatory exertion or regulatory effort, if you will, in, in the psychologically. And so the way we're interpreting it here is that children are having to engage regulatory control in order to handle the stimulus and maintain psychological or physiological homeostasis, uh, and it's detected in their heart rate. Again, I want to show you the normal response first in the control group, that's the diamonds. And you can see here a pattern that makes complete sense in the control group. Under negative emotions, they're having to regulate more than under positive emotions. When they have to suppress, whether it's negative or positive, suppressing takes more exertion and more regulation than not suppressing. So this makes a lot of sense. The, the regulating pattern is fitting very well for the normal kids. For the kids who have ADHD and normal prosocial behaviors, normal uh, emotional traits behaviorally, we see a similar pattern, a little bit muted. And it's interesting that for positive induction, they um, didn't release regulation as much. So there's some, we had some interesting sub-story sub about problems handling positive emotions in ADHD. But by and large, this group had a fairly normal response. What's striking is the Calson emotional group or the non-pro-social group of ADHD kids didn't uh, face any regulatory demand. It's like this did not challenge them at all. The emotions in this film were not pulling, not moving them. Importantly, when we asked the children to rate the intensity of the clips and the affect in the clips, all the groups rated them exactly the same. This group recognized the emotions and described them accurately in their ratings, but didn't show the physiological response to the film. So they're showing what we would expect from a chaos and emotional group. Again, what I want to stress here is you really can't explain this very well by a severity pattern. This number of ADHD symptoms was the same in these two groups. And that was one of the things we were very happy about when we divided these groups up. They were ADHD severity was the same, but one group's got a different emotional pattern. And it's, it, you, I suppose you could try to do it, but it's very hard because th this group is equally severe clinically, but lo and behold, completely different physiologically. You might get a severity pattern if you really want to stretch it because least severe, middle, most here doesn't, doesn't work here. Maybe, maybe it doesn't really work there, but you could perhaps stretch it a little bit. By and large, it's a nice, pretty good separation. Our second system, and a lot of, a lot of the model that I've been using is really a dual process model where we kind of posit a top-down regulatory system and a bottom-up uh, regulatory system here. So, in, and we crudely do this actually following some ideas from Ted Bouchain, who used to be University of Washington, looking at parasympathetic and sympathetic. So the RSA is really a parasympathetic index. The pre-ejection period, the second index we're looking at, is really a sympathetic index. And uh, oriented on the y-axis here, um, the um, shorter your pre-ejection period here, the faster your heart is, is, is quickly pumping it out, the more aroused you are. So it's inverse. Less arousal is up here, more arousal is down here. Again, the control group in the middle, diamonds. Here's their mo modal level of arousal throughout. You can see that there's not a big, the conditions could be ignored here. I could have just showed you a bar for each group, but a uh, little bit of variation. But by and large, they're, they're, they're there. Uh, typical ADHD kids are a little more aroused here uh, centrally, and this is all significant in every condition here. What's striking, again, is that the chaos and emotional kids are less aroused across the board. They do even out uh, here in the positive emotions, but especially in the negative emotions, they're not being uh, brought to life by this at all. Uh, and again, with the control group in the middle, it's impossible to explain the results based on severity, clinical severity, because the control group is in the middle and the two clinical groups on the other sides. So we've got evidence here of subtypes that are configural, that are not just severity, 
some physiological validation of it. It fits behaviorally, it fits physiologically. It's a possible direction forward to create subtypes that might be informative for course of illness, for treatment response, for etiology, and so on. Our, our third approach uh, is to kind of get in sync with the NIH and its latest developments. Um, I can't resist a little dig at NIH here. I, I love them, but um, they're developing a new strategy called RDOC, which is the concept is that you should discover basic dimensions of psychological and neural functioning and use those basic behavioral, neural, biological dimensions to guide your multidimensional approach to psychopathology. Seems like psychologists have always been doing that anyway, but now it seems like we're going to hit the mainstream, so I'm very happy about this. Um, <clears throat> so we're taking fundamental traits, and then we're going to use some uh, mathematical tools to um, try to let the data tell us what the natural types are, and then cross-validate them using our neuropsychological and other kinds of measures. So what are biologically informed dimensions that we can use to create subtypes? Well, there's many ways to approach this, but um, it's something I've been thinking about for many, many years and thinking about how you could do this in systems. But two basic strategies that we can easily use in our data. The first is to take the neuro same neuropsychological measures that I showed you earlier, all of which are, are hypothesized to relate to particular neural systems or neural modules, and most of them have pretty good functional imaging data to support some partially distinct linkages to neural activation patterns. So we can use these neuropsychological measures and think about those as indexes of certain kinds of biological dimensions. A second approach that I uh, have been particularly advocating is to go to temperament theory and temperament models for the simple reason that the temperament traits are really well articulated in relation to biological systems and neural systems. And, and I've done a lot of work myself, although my work is not that original. I mean, it's really uh, comes from earlier work by uh, Mary Rothbart, Michael Posner, many, many other people over the, century, over the decades and years who have gradually done this. But um, I've also been interested in trying to do this. But here's a very simple heuristic for three basic systems that are fairly uh, e easy to defend and I think could be defended pretty strongly for what these behavioral traits might be uh, related to in terms of neural connectivity. So we want to use these temperament traits as a way to divide up ADHD. And then um, I'll talk about these two approaches right now, and then uh, what I won't talk about today but that we're in the middle of doing, you can do the same thing, of course, directly with neural measures and with genetic systems and molecular or metabolic systems of genes that would also be a way to create biologically based groups, and we're, we're working on that now, and I think that's also going to be very interesting in its results. But let me talk to you about these two approaches and see how they turned out. So uh, we take our measures, and what I want to take a slight detour here to introduce our method of uh, mathematically finding the groups. And I mentioned to you that most of the work on ADHD in finding groups empirically has been using latent profile analysis, which is an offshoot of latent class analysis, which is a type of cluster analysis. And there's also been a number of works just using regular k-means cluster analysis. The result of all of that work in ADHD, when looked at in, from a mixture model point of view, has been to find severity dimensions or severity groups, not configural groups. And so it's been disappointing, at least to me, in terms of the promise of this, uh, those approaches. So we here are adopting a different approach from mathematical rather than statistical uh, theory. And it's, uh, there's a, a family of techniques called graph theory, and within graph theory there's a group of techniques called community detection or modularity analysis. And um, traditionally this method has been used to organize variables. It's been used to figure out the patterns of growth in yeast cells or the patterns of organization of the internet or um, it, it's a way to organize variables. People have certainly been using it now for several years to organize brain networks to, to find uh, brain, brain systems. But here we're using it in a new way or a different way, which is that um, we get, uh, we flip the matrix. So here, the way the data are set up, we have the children in the columns here and their neuropsychological scores here on different measures. And this allows us obviously to correlate the kids to each other rather than correlate the variables. And then we can create a child by child correlation matrix. And then from a graph theory point of view, instead of finding patterns in, in, in graph theory, you have nodes which are either your variables, but here they're the people, the nodes are the kids, and the edges or the connections between them now are actually the scores on the tests. And the, we try to group the people according to their correlation structure of the kids on the, on the measures. And the mathematical algorithm does this. 
basically using a, a, a system where it, it looks at er systematically every possible combination of grouping the kids and finds the best, the best grouping. We had a big enough sample here that we could split the sample in half and do this twice so that we could re replicate our own result uh, in the sample. So that was uh, an advantage for us. One of the things I like about this method is that it quantifies the degree of groupness. There's a statistic called Q, which in the simple terms, down at the bottom, it's simply telling you to what extent the edges fall within groups compared to what would happen in a, in a random uh, group. You know, so it's really the improvement on random groupness. So the nice thing about the statistic, it can give you a score of no groups. It can give you a zero if there really aren't any groups. And we've seen that happen with some of our uh, models that we've run, where it really gives you a Q of point one or point oh five, there really aren't any groups there, and that's kind of nice. In fact, in fact uh, I'll come to the, some, uh, an example of that here in a second. Um, typically, the convention in, in the literature is that above about a point three, you have reliable groupness, although you still have to compare that to various random permutations of your sample to make sure that that's really holding in your particular sample, but there's a number of ways to test this against um, you know, various uh, random disturbances of the data. And then an optimization algorithm just tries to best separate the groups as best it can and then tell you how well it's done. So this is a strategy we use. And these, uh, the, the nice thing now, although the, uh, the calculus and the algebra behind this method are, are, are uh, fairly mind-bending, uh, the concept is quite simple. And the um, MATLAB scripts now are easily, easily available online uh, thanks to Olaf Sporns in Indiana. So we were able to put this together here pretty readily and run some of these. Uh, algorithms and study them. And our first effort at this used the neuropsychological measures, and this was published in Panis earlier in the year. And um, this, this graph here on the left is called a spring embedding graph. This is a graphical way to show the way this graph is drawn is if there's a strong correlation, these, each dot represents a child, and a strong correlation, they're close together, and a weak correlation, they're far apart. So it just kind of graphically groups them or spreads them according to their strength of correlation. And you can see here, like this first group is pretty strongly separated from the red group, for example. The yellow group is kind of in between them, and, and some kids are on the edge where they could go in either group. And, and here the blue group. So you kind of see the strength to which this is working. Here's a child who could be in either group, and he ends up, happens to end up in the red group, but if you change one thing, he might be in the blue group. So you kind of get, and what, what's kind of nice as a subtext here is you get easy to classify kids and hard to classify kids. And, and so if you change one thing or change some of the variables, some kids will move groups, other kids will always stay in the same group. And one of our long-term goals is to really look at the robustness of this type of method across uh, uh, different variables, different methods, and see if we can find children who are easy to classify, who always go together on a wide range of methods and variables versus those who are hard to classify and, and move around depending on what you're looking at. That will help us focus on, first, let's explain the easy to classify ones. We can really help clinicians there. Then let's look to the hard to classify ones and figure out those are going to be the, the clinical dilemmas. But what's, here's the result that I really liked. We, we ran all of our, and these are latent variables. We had numerous measures. We combined them into really reliable latent variables to um, address a lot of the reliability issues in neuropsychological and cognitive measures. And we hit most of the major theories of ADHD. We have response inhibition, working memory, alertness, which is the CPT D prime measure, response variability, which has gotten a lot of press uh, the last couple of years, temporal information processing, which is you know, thanks to Rich Ivory, uh, you know, down at Berkeley, Sarah Beller, uh, frontal connections, memory span, and response speed. And the way that these divided out is that, the, that each group had a different deficit. So Again, the control group, normal controls are at zero in this graph. The first group of ADHD kids had low arousal, low alertness, but they're normal and everything else. The second group had problems with memory span, slow speed and poor working memory, and normal and everything else. The third group had poor temporal information processing, so this might be our cerebellar group, but they're normal and everything else. And the fourth group has got highly variable responding, so that might be our stratum group, and then they're normal and everything else. So what it really shows in a very nice, precisely described mathematical way is that it's not the same kids doing badly on the same tasks that causes the groups to, to differ. Part of the reasons why we may have small effects or only modest effects in separating ADHD from controls is we're measuring these things where some of the kids are doing bad on one task and some are doing bad on another task. And we're lumping them all together and saying it's a modest effect. 
what you can see here is a very large effect within each of these groups. These effects, 1.0, are, are bigger than most effects that you would see averaging these groups altogether. It's a really nice demonstration of the concept that some of the kids have problems in, in temporal information processing, some have problems in, in executive functioning. If we could get clinical types like this to work out, we'd have a very nice assessment protocol for neuropsychologically or biologically validated subtypes. Now there's a subtext here that's interesting in this case, which is that when we looked at the control group, we also saw um, profiles in the control group that were similar. And so the subtypes of ADHD actually are nested in the control group profile, so it adds a little bit of complexity. And it seems like what may actually be happening in the case of neuropsychological measures is that you have profiles of functioning. Some people are more verbal, some are more nonverbal, some are faster, some are slower. But you've got a cluster of abilities, and for the well-adapted children, they uh, may have an area where they're weak, but they've got several other areas where they're strong that essentially make up for that. In the case of ADHD, what we saw was when we nested these within the control groups, they would have additional weaknesses so that it was as if their system could make up for its area of weakness by a str comparable strength. And so there's a nuance here that, that I'm, I'm sort of bypassing, but the theme I want to get across again is that we have groups that have distinct neuropsychological types, and the critical thing here, I didn't show you a slide for it, their ADHD symptom severity is similar. So again, this is not severity groups. There is no reliable difference between ADHD severity of symptoms in these groups. So it's, they have the same level of ADHD symptoms for different reasons as far as their profile. That's, that's the kind of thing that we're after as a promising direction. All right, the second way we do this is with the temperament-based types. And this is the hot off the presses work that I wanted to run by you today. And here we um, came back and used the temperament in middle childhood questionnaire. Parents rated this. Uh, it's got 16 scales. Uh, and these are usually generally thought of as breaking into three super factors, like I showed earlier. But here we kept the 16 scales because we wanted the maximum information for the uh, optimization algorithm to use to create our modularity groups. Again, a fairly large sample, uh, almost 250 children with ADHD, uh, 130 typically developing children. We deliberately have a larger ADHD group because we're really interested in heterogeneity there. And here it worked, I think, in some ways even better. Um, because we started out the modularity analysis with everybody, controls and ADHD together, and um, at that first level, all that happened was the algorithm recovered the ADHD, almost perfectly recovered ADHD versus controls. So the temperament ratings really differed dramatically between the two typical and untypical kids. So that was really good for us because it meant that we could then follow a hierarchical approach, and this is what Sporns has recommended. We can then go and then look within each group again. In this case, we looked within the control group, we did not see groups. Here's where our modularity was zero. There were not groups in the control group. Temperament did not have subtypes in the controls. That is a problem for those who think there are personality types in kids, but it's not a problem for us. We like that result um, because now we can focus on variation in the ADHD group that is apart from normal. And so within the ADHD, we got strong modularity there in contrast to the control group. But the key was over 0.4. We've done a variety of of efforts to disturb those data to figure out how robust those findings are, and it appears to be robust. And so now we want to try to validate it. Let me sh describe the groups to you that we got. We got three groups of ADHD kids. We're labeling them for the moment as uncomplicated ADHD, ADHD with negative emotion type, and ADHD extroverted type, or surgent type, or exuberant type, you could say. And uh, here's what the profiles look like. Again, just to orient you, the control group is always at zero here, and at this time, it's legitimate to do this because there are no groups in the control group, so we can use the whole control group as our comparison mean. These are z-scores. You can see the effects are very large here, which is really nice. And um, everything is uh, above or below is different than normals. So in the first group of tasks or measures are all in the domain of control. We have impulsivity, inhibition, attentional focus, and we see here really the ADHD signature. This, all three groups have the same signature here. They all are impulsive, disinhibited, and poor attentional focus compared to controls. And you can see by these standard error bars, these are very reliable differences. Now, we do have a severity profile here. You can see that the uncomplicated group is much milder than the other two groups. The other two groups are pretty similar. So we have differentiation simply on severity here with what we call our core ADHD profile. So part one is the L of ADHD by this classic ADHD profile. Then we get to the question of differentiating within these groups. So the next set of, of domains all have to do with negative emotionality, tendency to be angry, and so on. 
And what's really striking here is we see configurable variation between the subtypes. Look here, for example, at discomfort, at fear. You can see that group one and group, I'm sorry, group two and group three are on the opposite side of the graph here, and so they're very well differentiated. Um, here it's just severity and how angry they are, but here it's configurable. These guys are, are more comfortable than normal. These guys are less comfortable than normal. And same thing here for fear and sadness. And so it's, it's a really clear difference in the groups on negative emotions. Then the last set of areas has to do with social confidence or social dominance or extroversion or surgency. It includes activity level. But you can see here again we see configure a pattern. Here you can see that the mild group is different than the other two. Uh, here again. But here we see strong differences in shyness between group two and group three. Here again in activity level, group uh, one and group two. So one is above normal, one is below normal. So again, this not just a pattern of normal, worse, and even worse than that, but above and below, the control group in the middle. So that's the kind of configural difference that we want to see that shows us that these groups are really different in configuration, not just in um, extremeness of a single trait or dimension. So that was very encouraging. This looks like a beginnings of a configural pattern. Can we get some kind of external validation here? The first thing we tried to do to externally validate was look at our, our follow-up over time. We've been able to follow almost 100 of these kids so far. We're going to eventually follow all 400 of them, so we'll have you know, another year. We'll have a much clearer answer. But the preliminary look at this, having followed uh, 93 children, uh, the first thing we looked at was prediction. One of the things clinicians care about, can we predict who's going to develop a new disorder, who's going to get worse, or who's going to deteriorate over time? So here we're obviously holding constant their, level, their time one disorders. The uh, negative emotion group did have more comorbidity at time one, but over and above that, how much new comorbidity do they get? You can see that in the uncomplicated group and the extroverted group, there was new disorder onset at similar level in both groups a year later, but double the level, more than double the level of new disorder onsets in the negative emotion group. Very important to realize that this could not be predicted by comorbidity at time one, because we're predicting over and above time one comorbidity. And secondly, um, we looked at this in relation to ADHD symptoms, and this group effect predicted new onsets reliably over and above ADHD symptoms at time one, but the reverse was not true. Once you took these groups into account, ADHD symptoms did not predict disorder onset. So in other words, this performs better than using clinical symptoms in any, in any way to predict new disorder onset. It works better than using comorbidity. It works better than using ADHD severity to predict new disorder onset. So it's new information that has value added clinically and has, makes biological sense, relates to biological systems for what's going on with these groups. So we think it's promising from that point of view. We then look at them in terms of our emotion regulation task and psychophysiology. And here, I, what I, what I want to stress in this slide is we really separate out the negative emotion group. It's the group that's the outlier, right? It's different than the other two groups. Here in the physiology, the pattern is different. First of all, again, the normal controls here, the pattern you're familiar with, this nice step function on the task. In, now, the uncomplicated ADHD are a perfectly normal response. You can see here that there's nothing different about them autonomically. We could almost say that these kids, gosh, they really have anything wrong with them from the point of view of a Jerry Wake, Wakefield, you know, core dysfunction, you know, harmful dysfunction. There's no dysfunction physiologically here for the uncomplicated ADHD group. For the negative emotion group, they're a little bit uh, less regulated here. Again, this is the baseline here. So the important thing here is that baseline, there's a little bit of these three groups are showing some regulatory control being exerted on this task. They're seeing this emotional film and they're engaging their regulatory system to handle it. This group, which now I want to call thrill-seeking, they're relaxing their regulation. They're really getting in, they're just releasing into this experience. There's no regulation. In fact, they're relaxing their regulation here. Remarkable opposite of baseline, opposite direction from baseline. So really, and especially for positive induction, they really go to town with letting go of all regulation and they're having a party there, basically, you know. So this is a really striking outlier. But now the, the nice thing is the outlier group is now group two. The extroverted, now surgeon, now thrill-seeking group is outlier. In contrast to here, where the negative emotion group is the outlier, 
So we're able to separate all these groups out using different kind of cross-validators and show that depending on how you look at it, this is a valid, distinct group. The, the next step, obviously, which we're in the middle of doing now, and I, don't, I was hoping I had these analyses ready, but I didn't have them ready, is to look at these kids on brain imaging differences and see what happens to them if we can identify neural imaging systems, and then we'll also look at them genetically. So that's still to come. Uh, and then the, the final acid test of this will be when we have the all the time two data, can we, can we repeat the modularity and find the same kids in the same groups? That'll be the real uh, test, because one of the fatal problems really for ADHD subtypes in DSM is that at time two, their kids aren't in the same groups. And so that's really just a state-like presentation. It doesn't have any enduring trait-like quality. Here, we could fall to the same fate when we're done. I don't know what will happen, but we'll know that in a, in a little while when we get the time two data in, and we'll, we'll analyze that and for sure let, let everybody know if it, if it works. So we'll have to let you know even if it doesn't work, but ho hopefully it will work. Um, but that's, that's really what we're after. That's kind of the, the, to me, the ultimate gold standard here is that those kids stay in those groups in some way over time, either physiologically or behaviorally or both. And one hypothesis is they may change behaviorally, the, the profile may change, but the groups will stay the same, so the kids are still in, in a group together. Uh, or they may change behaviorally but not physiologically. Those all remain to be seen. But so far, this is promising, certainly performing better so far than ADHD subtypes. All of what I've showed you physiologically falls apart with ADHD subtypes. You don't get any nice differences at all with ADHD subtypes in predicting new, out, new disorders or in predicting physiological response. All right, so the comment here on uh, here that I think I want to just leave you with is that there is, I think, a lot of possible ways to get better subtypes than we have. There probably are subtypes. There seems to be pretty good evidence that if you use physiological validators, you can show non-severity-based configural subtypes that have promise, that are worth pursuing, that are worth investigating, that are more promising way forward than uh, just using DSM types. We can, at least in initial data, with obviously very preliminary, but it looks like we might be able to improve cl on clinical prediction based on what we currently uh, assess, and that, that isolates this negative emotion group. We can also use some physiological validation, uh, very simple physiological measures to isolate a surgeon group, and then we'll get additional uh, a lot of additional work to do, obviously, to tie this all together. We haven't yet looked at the calcine emotional group to see where it's going here and, and what happens to ADDs, et cetera. So we've got some integration to do, obviously, but these are some different directions that we're exploring that we think have promise. All right, so the purpose of doing all this work on the phenotype is so we can get back to etiology. And um, I, so I just want to take a few minutes here and say a couple things about etiology of ADHD because um, I think it's an often misunderstood area and I, I want to make a few comments on it. You know, first of all, genetics. Uh, it's, it's well, I think, well known and often said that ADHD is a highly heritable condition. You know, I never did turn my microphone on. You guys been hearing me okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm staying by this microphone. Now I'll turn this one on so I got twice as much chance of being heard. You can see that, that uh, this, this is a famous slide, ADHD highly heritable. And because of this, uh, I, I think this has started to change. I want to believe it is, but I think one of the uh, things that's happened in the last 20 years is that the field has really gone hog wild trying to find genes for ADHD as well as other, other psychopathologies. And um, you know, up until about a year ago, I think the conclusion was that that didn't work. We really couldn't find very, very good genes for, for these disorders. That's started to change. I think there's some, some better analyses coming out. We're starting to see some pretty good results that are going to, I think, be emerging in the next year or two with work that's in, in the pipeline showing actually that we are getting some pretty powerful effects for genes for ADHD and schizophrenia and, and of course, there's been significant progress in autism, molecular genetics. But nonetheless, um, I think the consensus is now at hand that it's not all genetic, you know, that, that the heritability, it's, it's, it's not even, not only is it not one, it's probably not 80 percent uh, genetic and there's a couple reasons for that, but the most important reason that I want to um, convey to you, and actually here's three reasons. The, the environmental risks keep popping up. You keep getting to predict by environmental risk, so that's got to be dealt with. Um, the second is, is the gene by environment effects, and the third is this whole brave new world of epigenetics, which is very exciting and is really changing, I think, our fundamental understanding of the entire um, almost basic theorems of, ge of how genetics works and behavior is, uh, is starting to be questioned. In fact, it's fun to listen to the epigenetic discussions because really the 
the fundamental algorithms of genetics, the fundamental theorems of genetics in terms of how inheritance works. Uh, do we have a fundamental rethinking going on in epigenetics or just a slight modification of our thinking? And uh, this is part of what it's fun to hear the epigenetics experts talk about. But in any case, it's, it's opening up, I think, real potential to think about how environments and genes go together. But I want to pause a minute on the gene by environment story um, because I think it's very fundamental for how we think about, about this. And the important thing to realize, first of all, is that when heritability is 0.8, it doesn't mean that genes are 0.8. It means that heritability of liability is 0.8. Gene by environment interactions and gene by environment correlations are still affecting the disorder itself. To demonstrate this, I'm just going to use a very simple example here, which comes from tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis, how many think it's purely genetic? Nobody. Okay, that's good. Well, 150 years ago, many people did think it was genetic, and the reason was it ran in families. We now know, of course, that it ran in families because of infection, infectious uh, bacteria. But uh, at the time, twin studies were done, and um, they, they did show heritability coefficients. And here, I've just calculated some simple heritabilities and across five of the best twin studies done back in the day on tuberculosis. The average heritability is almost 0.7, pretty darn close to, I think, the ADHD heritability, once you take into account radar bias, is so on, it's probably closer to 0.7, it's probably not really 0.8. So it's almost the same heritability as ADHD. Now, there are some caveats for infectious disease and twin studies that, of course, are, need to be considered. Uh, identical twins spend more time together than non-identical twins do. So there are some important confounds for infectious disease and twin studies. But there's a really nice review paper done 30 years ago now uh, that works that through very carefully. And it seems pretty clear that even if you take into account all those various artifacts that can confound twin studies of infectious disease, that there's still a substantial heritability uh, for tuberculosis. And in fact, even now, if you look at Medline, there's quite a vibrant literature asking about the genetics of tuberculosis. And the, the, obviously, the question is not whether genetic genes are causing tuberculosis. The question is how genes are rendering susceptibility and resistance to tuberculosis, just like genes can cause uh, susceptibility to other diseases. And so this susceptibility model, I think, is actually now quite well accepted in much of, of infectious disease literature in medicine, why not in psychopathology? And so the uh, part of the concept here, I think, that we have to recognize is that the heritability studies are showing us heritability of liability to ADHD. We don't know to what extent the disorder itself is being carried forward by those same genetic effects or, in fact, is activating effects in the environment, such as stress, prenatal stress, poor nutrition, um, environmental toxicants, and so on. The reason that this is an important perspective is it could allow us to integrate very nicely the striking findings on prospective predictors of ADHD from environmental exposures with the striking heritability findings with what we know about epigenetics. It could, it could tie it together. So I think it's a very promising way to think as in terms of a liability by experience model of genetics of ADHD rather than a gene main effect for ADHD. The gene by environment interactions, of course, are now exploding. They're everywhere. They're easy to find. Um, and it's important to caution, this is just one of our several that we've published, uh, that the sensitivity to family conflict uh, interacts with genotype for kids with ADHD in terms of predicting teacher-rated behavior problems. Um, and there are several like this that we and others have shown for ADHD. We published a review on this a couple of years ago in the Orange Journal. And of course, there's a massive literature on this for depression and for antisocial behavior, looking at serotonin transporter, MAO, and so on. With, with stress and, and so on. Um, there are also serious uh, artifact dangers in looking at these molecular gene by environment interactions. These have to be interpreted with caution. But it seems like once you look at those artifacts, again, we probably are seeing some real gene environment effects in a couple of these cases. And uh, once we can get to the level of actual a active processes, this could be promising. So I want to talk a minute about the environments that we might not look at. but the the bottom line is here, there's a lot of work to do in genetics. I think the genetics work is going to get revived in the next couple of years with probably some new and more powerful findings that are in the pipeline. But that said, the environments also need to get revisited and I think be pursued more aggressively for early environmental predictors of ADHD. The question is which environments? Those of you that do this kind of work probably have the same experience I have. If you're on an airplane, as I just was this week, and your neighbor finds out that you study ADHD, well, you know what happens next. They tell you what causes it, and then they don't really want to know what you think. Uh, so here's the theories that I've heard. The, um, 
The first one has to do with sociological theories and um, uh, there certainly have been very serious articles written about pharmaceutical industry influence and a great deal of concern expressed all the way up to the New England Journal of Medicine and all the way down about this issue and I know that many departments of psychiatry and medicine have, have really tightened up on the degree to which they will collaborate with pharmaceutical companies on research and, and so on to reduce some of this perceived or actual conflict of interest. So this may be a true uh, sociological factor in terms of the treatment of ADHD, but it's hardly an explanation for the causes of the problem, right? It could explain why we have excess treatment. What about collapse of civilization? Are we just falling apart and the kids are the, uh, you know, canary in the coal mine? There actually are some secular trends in uh, children's behavior and emotional problems that do change from decade to decade. Uh, as far as I can tell, those are not linear um, entirely. Um, it may be that as economics change, children's problems do get worse. That would stand to reason to some extent. And certainly makes sense that the most vulnerable children would show the worst problems. So there may be something to look at as far as sociological context. But again, it's, it's, a, it's probably um, beyond our capability to fully explain ADHD based on purely on sociological effects. Um, we used to joke that uh, the main cause of ADHD was compulsory schooling. And I think there is a place for that, but I still would argue that that's not really explaining the whole thing, and I'll come back to why that is in a minute. All right, the second major theory we hear is it's in incompetent caregiving either by parents or teachers. I think many of you are already aware of research debunking this. Um, the way that I think about this is certainly it's true that if you videotape the parents or videotape the teachers, you will see, and if you videotape me or you with these kids, you will see the caregiver doing things that they probably know they shouldn't do. And so we can see that uh, the poor parenting, ineffective teaching uh, tactics probably help maintain and perpetuate the behavior problems, but are probably not the originating cause. These are probably child-driven causes because when you medicate the child, the parenting improves. When you swap the parents out between control parents and ADHD parents with the kids, the parenting improves in the, in depending on the child and depending on the parents. So, Really, although there is a literature on ADHD in the parents and this, this level of disorganization in some of these families, primarily at least by age four or five years of age when these studies have been done, the effects appear to be more child-driven rather than parent-driven. And so again, while the family may be part of the picture, probably not the primary cause of the ADHD. Rather, we probably have to look earlier in development at uh, early developmental effects. Um, and of course, you've got some interest here with Dimitri on on early environmental effects and media and likewise. Uh, are, are we starting school too young? Perinatal problems, a major correlate, although nonspecific. Um, psychosocial stress during pregnancy is a very promising direction. Again, it's not going to be specific to ADHD, but it's probably going to be giving us some mileage. Um, prenatal, postnatal diet or toxicants is a very interesting direction. And we've got really cool data now at OHSU from our primate center showing that prenatal maternal diet really does predict change, dramatic changes in infant behavior holding uh, infant diet constant. Uh, so you randomly assign random experiment, you can really see dramatic differences in temperament and behavior in the infants just based on the maternal fat intake, the maternal weight gain. So there clearly are um, powerful effects here that we see in, in non-human primates that would be consistent with what we've seen in correlational studies in humans uh, and uh, would, would suggest that there is some, some value in going after and more carefully the mechanisms for pre prenatal nutrition effects. And then toxin effects, I think, need to be considered very seriously as well. Many of the neurotoxins are going to affect, they're designed to affect nervous system transmission and brain and insects. We have some of the same neurotransmitters in our brains that the insects do. Uh, and so we naturally are going to be affected too. And, and so that's a uh, promising direction. So I, just to give you one example of this in our work, we've looked a little bit at lead. Um, Lead, of course, is a, there, gets into the media every now and then, but even at population typical levels of lead, and the national level of exposure here in 2002 is the red line, and this is just a one, one microgram per decaliter. This is a low level of lead. I mean, the, this is a big success story, really, for our uh, EPA and regulations because 30 years ago, the average level was way up here at probably about 10 or 12 or something. So. This is a dramatic improvement in public health to have this lead level for children be down to here. But even at this level, there's a reliable difference between the lead levels in ADHD and uh, combined type versus not and versus controls. And you can see in this sample that we took, 
the lead levels are just exactly normal for the population. This is not a superexposed lead. These are safe, normal lead levels, but there's still a correlation here with ADHD. That uh, mediates, uh, you know, we, the, one of the theories that we have is that lead occupies sites in stratum. In fact, it does mediate uh, the those stratal signals like stop signal reaction time, response variability, do fully mediate the association of lead with hyperactivity in our data. Uh, and so that's a, a confirmation of that picture. And then most interestingly, we can see gene by environment effects uh, on how much lead you have. That, and here we looked at a gene called the HFE gene, hemochromatosis gene. And depending on which allele of that gene you have, you have more lead in your blood. And this is because uh, this gene modulates iron uptake in the gut. Iron and lead compete. And so lead, um, lead uptake and iron uptake are are uh, related, and here we can see that, in fact, this gene is reliably modulating the amount of lead in the blood for these kids. And what I'm not showing here is a slide that shows that by the same token, the correlation, and here's the, this is the real payoff, the correlation between lead and hyperactivity depends on genotype. At least in girls in our preliminary sample, with one genotype, the correlation of lead and hyperactivity was 0.4. With the other genotype, it was zero. So some kids are genetically immune to the lead, and others are genetically sensitive to the lead. And that's kind of the target that we're going after here. These, these lead exposure levels that the whole population of them may look like they have very small effects, but in subkids having a large effect. That's the G by E interaction that we care about. That's got impact for uh, how we think about policy. Now lead is, again, a complicated story because lead has been reduced. ADHD has not gone down. Why is that? Well, we've introduced lots of other pollutants besides lead that have similar effects. My favorite example is manganese that replaced lead as in uh, unleaded autofuel, has similar stratal occupancy sites in the brain as lead does. And so um, it may be that we replaced one with a similar acting mechanism. And so the fact that we reduced lead doesn't mean we reduced all the neural insults. Lead is just an example of how this might work. It's, it's very unlikely, almost impossible for it to be the main explanation for ADHD. I'm not claiming that it is, merely that it's an illustration of how this might work in one example toxicant that's well understood uh, and very common in the environment. All right, so to summarize here then, um, what we're trying to do here is create alternative mechanism-based groups that can be clinically predictive forward as well as etiologically predictive backward. It seems to be helpful to broaden just from a narrow idea of controlled attention to other kinds of attention and even on to uh, emotion. Uh, and again, to get to beyond the symptom domains that we have now, which do not necessarily have a good neural theory behind them other than post hoc, to move to measures that do have good, robust neural systems linking them. And then to think of this going back to etiology, not from a main effective environment or a main effective experience, but a susceptibility by experience model, which essentially would end up being an epigenetic model and trying to map that out prospectively. And obviously, we want to integrate these going forward as we put these pieces together. I want to thank um, several key collaborators that are listed up here. Uh, we have tremendous staff and community support, as well as funding support that has been instrumental. So, and thank you for letting me come and talk to you. It's been a lot of fun, and we can use the rest of the time for discussion. And I think we've got a microphone that's going to go around right next to you. All right. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It was a very, very interesting talk. I had a question about how to make sense of some of your findings uh, clinically. For example, with um, group three of, of ADHD, is that going to be some of the kids right now I'm diagnosing with comorbid conditions like ADHD plus depression, ADHD plus bipolar, ADHD plus anxiety? Or, uh, and then secondly, is, is there are reasons to think why um, these different subgroups would respond to treatment differently. On the first question, yes, the negative emotion group, even at time one, had more comorbid anxiety, depression, and oppositional defiant than the other groups. They still didn't have a lot at time one. I mean, they had like 25 percent of those kids versus zero percent kind of a thing. But by time two, you can see that they, uh, a large number of them are getting new. This is new onsets, so if you add up the 40% of new onsets plus the 20% that already had something. And this includes oppositional defiant, which we're treating here almost as an emotional disorder because of the new findings on anger and future depression in those kids. 
And these kids are still young for depression, so the depression rates are still low. But we've got pretty good rates of anxiety and ODD in this group, probably up to over half of them now at time two. By the time we get out to time three or time four, we'll probably have a very high percentage of them with comorbid mood-related problems if you're willing to throw ODD into the mood domain for the moment. Um, and the comorbidity rates are lower here. So I think that's true. However, I should add that there are ODD and depressed and anxious kids in these other groups. So we, do, we don't get purely comorbid groups. If you just divide the kids in comorbidity alone, the results don't come out as clean for predicting new onsets or for predicting psychophysiology as they do here. But clinically, what you would want to see is not only comorbidity, but also, even without comorbidity, negative affect. A lot of anger. They don't meet ODD, but they sure have a lot of anger. Or they sure are unhappy or demoralized or sad or uncomfortable a lot. Even though I can't quite give them a diagnosis, they might be in this group that's at risk to go on to future mood or, or oppositional problems. And so if these results were to hold up, what we would eventually be saying is for clinicians, assess this temperament profile. And even if they don't have a disorder, recognize this is a group that's really at risk for developing these disorders. They've got ADHD plus all these other signs. That would kind of be the clinical take home there. And then for the other group, you know, for this mild group, we would say, boy, this group, they really, they don't have much wrong physiologically. They don't tend to go, get worse over time. This might be a group you can afford to take a wait and see approach with and tell the family, look, let's just see what happens or let's just monitor, you know, and of course there's cases where you do that now, but you're going more based on your instinct or maybe the fact that it's just mild or there isn't much impairment. Here you might have a little more robust thinking for that. And then the, and again, I want to stress this is very preliminary, but that would be kind of where this would go if it worked. And then with the surgeon group, um, this is a group that's going to have, uh, you know, physiological differences. What's the clinical impact? I think that what I really want to find out here is what the treatment response is whether that group may respond the best to standard you know, stimulant treatment, for example, because they aren't complicated by these mood and motion problems, or are they really going to go on to more antisocial careers over time? Um, I don't know. I suspect actually the negative emotion group is more likely to go antisocial, but will this be the group that if you give them um, you know, more skilled parenting or teaching, is this the group that you can get away with a nice uh, psychosocial intervention, and these are kids who are just too exuberant for their setting? Uh, and, and maybe, you know, very dominant and extroverted, but you give them a leadership role and you give them an outlet. Th these are all things that I would like to think about as far as future interventions. Okay, somebody over here. Uh, behind you first and then forward. Okay. Yeah, I had a similar question, Joel, just in terms of, of hypotheses that you're generating or maybe plans to study. The algorithms now are not differentiated in terms of subgroups, whether you've got ADHD or with hyperactivity or whether you don't, whether you have anxiety, whether you don't, whether you have conduct disorder, whether you don't, whether you've got callous on emotional traits, whether you don't. Mm -hmm. And are there um, plans, I guess, that you guys have to specifically test these things about blunting agents like guanfacine as compared to things that are different with what we've traditionally have done in yeah. terms of think moving forward with these ideas. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, first of all, I want to I recognize Chris Varley, who gave me a lot of great insights when I trained here. And um, also, I got one of my best quotes. Chris, I hope I can, I don't know if you remember this, but I really got a, a great quote. Back in the day when I was here, this book came out on hunters in a farmer's world, that ADHD was really hunters who just weren't suited to our, our culture. And what was the answer to that? And uh, Chris Varley uh, told me, all I know is they aren't going hunting with me. <laughs> and so um, I, I thought that was a wonderful, wonderful boiling it down uh, comment. Anyway, um, our first strategy really to answer your question is to um, really see if it predicts course. That's the first thing I want to know. Because none of our subtypes now really predict course very well either, other than worse kids do worse. I mean, right? But aside from that, we don't really predict course very well. Then if we can predict course, then I really would like to do the treatment uh, studies that you're describing. Would we get different medication response from different agents? And uh, this might be a place where we do. I've never collaborated really on pharmaceutical studies. This might be a place where we'd want to do that. So I think it's a really, really um, important direction. It's not in our immediate horizon, because right now I just want to see if these things are stable. Because if they're not, then I don't think this will work. You know? but, but if they are stable, then that would be a, a great direction. Yeah. 
So right, so connected, right here, yeah. Yeah, I had a question about um, these kids who are already diagnosed, that you diagnosed as ADHD. Are they on medication? And are they also getting other treatment moda modalities such as parenting, IEP work, 504s? And then how do you sort out what's effective? That's a great question. So the way we're doing this design is, um, get back to here, before they come in for all of our tests, whether it's this task or these tasks or the physiologic task, everybody's med free at that point. But when they first come into our study, what we do, the way we select the children is if they're on a long acting psychotropic medication like an antidepressant or something, they're excluded because then we can't test them med free. Uh, because our kids are young, we're bringing them in as early as seven years old, we don't have too much problem there. I mean, obviously we have to exclude some children, but we still get a large number of eligible kids. If they're taking a stimulant, we wash them out for seven half-lives before we bring them to the lab for testing. That takes care of these tests, probably, although some people still worry about rebound effects at that point. But um, obviously for the, or maybe not obviously, but, but I think there's some question for the temperament ratings, uh, how do uh, medication effects affect this? And let me go forward. I think I do have a slide on this. Um, let me just go back here. There it is. All right. Here's the medication on the temperament types. You can see here that the percent that are on stimulant meds uh, at the time that we assess them, see that in the negative emotion group, half of them were being treated with stimulant meds and about a third and about a quarter. Uh, and so the way that we think about this is that um, the stimulant meds is one indicator here of differences in the groups. Would we get different groups if we got a totally med naive group in a country that didn't do much medication, for example? We could get the full range of severity of ADHD, but they're med naive. Would, are the groups being affected by the medication? Is the parent rating of the, of the symptoms somehow changing? Or is this, is this, are these kids dysphoric from stimulant medication? That's why the parents are rating them or seeing that group. I don't, we, we can't answer that, so that's a possible confound to the results. We are tracking over time. Part of our strategy here is to do this, this longitudinal design. So we know their baseline. We do have detailed records on the psychosocial treatments that they're getting and so on, the IEPs and all that. And then what we're doing is following them annually. And what we're going to be able to then do eventually with our longitudinal models is use those time varying covariates of treatment type to, per, to see if we can do kind of lag models to see which treatments are predicting subtype change or subtype stability or even recovery. So this actually kind of goes back to Chris's question. We actually will be able to some extent in this naturalistic study show the predictors of improvement, which kids are, are showing better response on a given treatment related to these subtypes. We won't have experimental control until we go back and randomly assign them, of course, but this will be an initial gauge of that once we get our three or four years of data. So, yes. so yeah. uh, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, so it's really interesting listening to this one, how much the field has advanced in an area, but also I wonder where these patients go uh, or what they morph into because we tend not to see them or at least we don't recognize them as an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a simple question. What are the age range of the kids that you, when you refer to the kids in these studies, what are the age? And two, uh, in your second strategy with the unemotional callous kids, where would they map, do you think, into these subcategories? Yeah, two, two great questions. The first is these are uh, seven to 10 when they start out. Actually, seven to 11 now, I think we've expanded it. And so uh, most of the data you saw was in that age range. And then by time two, they're 12, seven, eight to 12. We're going to continue to follow them, hopefully, all the way through adolescence, but certainly up to at least one or two more years. Um, so that we're just starting to get into the beginnings of adolescence, but ad all the adolescent complexities hopefully are not a major factor yet. Um, although, and you can see that the gender is going to become a big deal, of course, as we get into adolescence for these groups. On the calcium and emotional integration, that's one thing we haven't done very much of it yet. I'm, I'm trying to think if you've even looked at that. I mean, I know it's on the radar. I've got um, Erica Musser, who's my um, very strong graduate student working on this. She's, I think, running those analyses this fall, because it's one thing we really want to know is how do these groups map together? Where did the calcium and emotional kids go in this, in this group? I don't know. I think my memory is that they split across these two groups, but um, I don't have the, the data with me to tell you for sure. It's a, it's a really relevant question. The same thing for the ADD kids. I want to know, um, let's see. We can see that the DSM inattentive type, you can see the ratios here. Um, 
most of them are in this first group, but a uh, number of them are over in this group, and I would guess that the inattentive group is a subset of these kids. Probably uh, some of them will be here and some of them will be here, but we want to map that up very precisely because that might give us further subgroups in a, in a sense. Not that we want it. We, with this sample size, we can't parse a whole lot more, but that might be eventually where it goes. Okay, I think um, we had a couple other people. All right, we'll go to Brian. All right. All right. Um, let's uh, thank Dr. Nag one more time for a wonderful. Thank you. So um, I want to take just a couple minutes here to uh, make some announcements. Um, one of the uh, one of the nice uh, traditions that is forming with our uh, first installment of Grand Rounds every year is that we love to host a get-together afterwards. And so I want to be sure that uh, those of you who haven't seen it already um, or haven't, uh, weren't aware that we were going to have a reception, uh, do please consider yourselves invited to um, just up here around the corner. Um, we're going to have a little uh, reception, a chance to get together and um, as is uh, very important this time of year, find out how we spent our summer vacations and also catch up with uh, <coughs> what other people are doing. Uh, as you drove in today, one of the things that uh, you may have noticed if you haven't been to Children's in a while is that the, uh, the footprint of the facility has expanded quite dramatically. Uh, and with that expansion also comes an opportunity for uh, the expansion of our department. And uh, as it's possible that you might have experienced an attentional blink when you signed in for CME today, I want to inform you that you also signed in to be a recruiter for us. Uh, we, we are looking for everybody to go out and identify your uh, friends in the community and elsewhere who may want to come and make uh, Seattle their home, uh, the University of Washington, their academic home. We have lots of opportunity now going forward uh, in the next couple years to recruit the best and brightest faculty and significantly expand uh, our footprint. So do please consider um, extending those invites uh, to friends elsewhere. At the upcoming meeting of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, we're pleased to be able to join the Washington State um, chapter of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and, uh, and have a reception at the Academy meeting. And so if you're planning on attending, do please come to that reception and also use that opportunity to bring uh, people in to get to know uh, what a great place this is. Um, I want to take also a moment here before people uh, do depart to just sort of look around and see if there's anybody that I should be introducing to the group because they're relatively recent arrivals. Um, Rachel Montag um, has recently completed her uh, postdoc and has joined us at the Autism Center. Uh, so be sure and say hi to her. She's sitting next to Dr. Varley up there. Um, um, while this uh, is sort of relatively older news, I see Molly Warner has sort of officially come into the, uh, the family of psychiatry. She's been here at Children's for a very long time uh, in the neurology department, but pleased to have you uh, join us, Molly. Um, I'm also pleased that Dr. Richard Veith, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, is here with us today and will be joining us at the reception, so do say, uh, say hello to him. <coughs> David Brager is with Thanks, David. So Joanna is here. Welcome, and do say hi to her as well. Oh, in the very back row, yes. And so Ying and Florence, uh, nurse practitioners working on the inpatient unit and uh, in outpatient <laughs> as well. And Aaron Lyon, our new faculty member. Where is Aaron? Oh, yes, Aaron Lyon, welcome. So, uh, and thank you everyone for helping me <laughs> spot these folks. 
Let me take also a minute and ask if there's anybody in the broader community who is new to Seattle or uh, new to this place that we might want to also make a special effort to say hello to you. Yes. Okay, thank you. So October, ADHD Awareness Week is coming up uh, the, from the 14th. All right, well, um, so I think that that's uh, all of the uh, announcements that I wanted to make. I want to again thank everybody for coming back and joining. Um, and please uh, join us up at the reception now and uh, have a great year. Very nice of that. Yeah.